a good job throughout Europe. Uh, red actually, the name red comes from 17th century Eastern European literature. The word red, you know, means passion, means love. And when it came over to the translation, so, you know, when you think about Valentine's Day, that isn't a hallmark greeting card thing, the whole red, the whole idea behind passion and love. It actually is from, you know, Eastern European literature. So they did a phenomenal job growing the business country after country after country. And then, you know, the, the U.S. is, you know, that's the diamond. That's the top of the mountain. You know, our U.S. market. This episode is brought to you by ERC. Let me ask you a question. Did you have a business during the pandemic with five or more employees? If the answer is yes, you might be leaving money on the table. All you gotta do is go to ERCBankroll.com and you can get your money. The best part about this, it only takes five minutes or less to see if you qualify. Go to ERCBankroll.com and put in your name, email address, answer two questions, Click on the submit button and you're done. It's that simple. And get your money. So don't wait. Go to ERC Bankroll. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Online Marketing Secrets Podcast. I'm your host, Lopez. So like and share this episode. P.S. And by the way, I would appreciate it if you left me a five star review in iTunes or wherever you're listening to the show right now. I would love to hear your feedback. Love it or hate it. You're the reason why I keep doing this show. So I want to hear what you think what you have to say, any show, topic, ideas, I want to hear all about it. So send me an email by going to my website at kingofcashflowwebsites.com or just go to support at kingofcashflowwebsites.com. Evil or. So with that being said, Today, today's guest is the definition of what an entrepreneur is. This guy, this man is an award winning entrepreneur. He's worked with, with some of the big brands like Kellogg's. He's built and sold not one, not two companies, but five companies. He's uh, started five startups, cashed out all five of them. And then he moved on and became a partner. And now he's president of a company called Red Chocolate. And in North America, and you can find this chocolate candy all across America and even on military bases. He has a background in finance, business, marketing, sales, operations, business management, along with private equity and investments and acquisitions with uh, multiple companies. You know, like I said, he's the definition of what an entrepreneur is. And he's the reason why I strive to bring on the best of the best people within their acquired field. My special guest today is Glenn Gardone. Welcome to the show. 
So where are you from? So I live right outside of Philly. I'm about an hour outside of Philly, PA. Yeah, I've been to, uh, I've been to Philly quite a few times. I uh, I actually like it there. You know what? It's got a great culture. It's got a great vibe. I mean, it's you know the birthplace of our nation. A lot of history. Great food. There's a lot to you know a lot of positives to it. And now uh, now we've got a really big hole in I-95 that we're trying to work out. As I'm sure you heard. So you know yeah. we're working on that. So but on that, you know, yeah, no, it's you know I've been here for. I'm about 20 years now, a little over 20 years. And, you know, whenever I get the chance, I go down there just to hang out and have some good food and people watch and everything else. So I enjoy it. I really enjoy it. I'm an East Coast person, but I've had the, the fortune of living in a lot of different places throughout the world, actually. Gotcha. So how did you get started in business? So I come from a very, very blue collar family. Um, you know, my success to me meant that I had a few bucks in my pocket so I could buy some food if I wanted it. Uh, and, uh, you know, went to college, first in my family go to college, graduated college. I'm not one of those people that, you know, 18 years old, found their passion. I, I didn't find my passion until I was in my 20s and had the opportunity to go into the food industry. You know, it was uh, ex Kellogg, ex Pepsi. Uh, met some great people, loved what I did. Uh, got a chance to, you know, on finance, sales, marketing, supply chain, all the different pieces, working with some great people. And, you know, that's how I, I grew my knowledge base, so to speak. So it's not like I spent the first 20 years, 15 years of my business career trying to figure out what I want to do. I did what I had to do. I enjoyed what I did. And every time in all the different situations, I just put it in the back of my head and said, at some point, I'm going to need this. I'm going to need this experience. I'm going to need this knowledge. And about 15 years ago, I decided to, uh, you know, embark on a different role and, you know, being either part of a team or leading that team and building companies and then, you know, building to a certain point and then getting the opportunity to sell them off to uh, other larger organizations that can make them bigger and better and do what they wanted to do. So. Uh, yeah, I see, man. Um, you know, there, you know, there's a lot of people that say stuff like, you know, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to start a big company. I never wanted to do any of this. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not that guy. I'm. I'm. I'm like you. I. I had to do what I had to do. The opportunity presented itself, and I took it. But I never yeah. grew up and said, "Hey, I wanted to. I want to do videos. I want to learn how to." how to market products i i was never that person at all so whenever i hear people say that i'm like that's great but that's that's not me <laughs> yeah you know, so i've got two boys uh and you know they're grown now and they both found their passion early in life so and <clears throat> i love seeing it because you know i see their drive and their determination and everything they're doing is to to further themselves and, and their goals and to get to their goals so love seeing it but myself you know growing up i wasn't surrounded by entrepreneurs honestly i didn't even know how to spell the word entrepreneur never mind say that's what i want to do so all like i said i want to do and, and throughout my life success has meant different things you know like you said when i first started i wanted a few bucks in my pocket so i could you know go enjoy dinner if I wanted to. To me, that was success. Yeah. I remember like when people said entrepreneur back in the day, that was a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I hear you. That, that is true. You know, I think about some of the quote unquote entrepreneurs I knew growing up, you know, they're probably in prison or dead at this point, but yeah. uh, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what is like working for like Kellogg's and, and big companies like that? So the, the way that for me, at least what I did was a, you got to work with some amazing people, some brilliant people, which is always fun to do. Cause I, I tell you, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy at the table. I, I know my limitations. Uh, so I got to meet with some and work with some really great people. Uh, I got to have some amazing mentors. Um, you know, the processes were in place and had been in place for years. And you know, you had to stay within those guardrails. Uh, so again, they employ tens, hundreds of thousands of people. And those folks, you know, what they do is important to that organization. Yeah, I, I'll give you an example. So I had a great mentor at Kellogg. 
And, you know, I wanted to be the hot shot, working hard, you know, being successful. And, you know, I was moving my career along at Kellogg, you know, and I had a mentor. Uh, and he sat me down and he said, uh, Glenn, how long has Kellogg been around before you showed up? I said, huh, it's been around 100 years. He said, how long do you think it's going to be after you leave? I said, probably another 100 years. He said, that's right. So slow down. Don't try to change the world and understand that this is a collective that's moving the business forward together, that you can't run ahead of everything and be upset because you're so far ahead. It's not how this organization works. It's not how big organizations work. Because again, I was young, I was hungry, I wanted to be successful. And so that really taught me, okay, you know, this is the process, so to speak. So when I got the opportunity to go on my own, then it was at my speed, which was probably five times, six times, 10 times faster than I was used to going, which I enjoyed being able to speed up the process. But, yeah. you know, at that point, you know, you got to find people that want to go at that same speed with you. Yeah, um, that's that's that was my experience. I, I worked for UPS for a couple of years in, in Atlanta. That was my mm -hmm. experience. Um, like, and people warned me even before I took the job that, hey, all that creative stuff that you do, they don't want any of that. You know, they're going to hire you just for one specific thing and just focus on that. And that's it. And they said, don't overstep your boundaries. Don't be given a lot of uh, extra advice. And they don't want any of that stuff, you know. So and that's it turned out to be true. And, you know, that was that was some good advice, you know. And that's true. You know, I remember for myself, probably one of the aha moments. I went into a meeting to discuss the meeting we were going to have later on that day. And that was what that meeting was about that I actually, uh, you know, was in. So I said, wow, you know, and that's where it started to, the light clicked on and said, Glenn, is, is this really, you know, what you're looking for? At that point, I felt confident in my abilities. And, you know, not to say that, uh, you know, I haven't had my successes and my step backs, but the fact was, I took all that experience that I had, that 15 years of experience working with big companies, working with great people and, you know, turned it into something that that I could grow and that I could put my name on it and, you know, be the leader within that organization. And it wasn't the fact that I wanted to lead, that that wasn't important to me. It was the opportunity of proving it to myself, I guess is the best way to put it. You know, I wanted to prove to myself that I could do what I thought I could do. And so, you know, the biggest difference again back then was, you know, you didn't have that quote unquote safety net. You know, you got that big company safety net, you know, and you know, every you know, I remember when I first started out, I was talking to a person who was very successful in business and 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 he told me, he said, Glenn, just so you know, all your employees are gonna love Fridays. Back then we got paid on Fridays because they're always gonna get paid on Fridays. You you're going to get paid on Tuesday. You're going to get paid on Wednesday. You're going to get paid when there's money left over. So that's a different mentality. And so it's true. You know, when we first started out, it was, you know, 12, 15 hour days. It was working on weekends. It was, you know, doing things at the house, you know, and the, you know, family wanted to do something else. I'm like, guys, I, I got to do something. I got to do this for the business or, you know, I've got to travel and I'm going to miss, you know, this. And, you know, that luckily my family looked at it and said, okay, you know, it's a sacrifice that is making, but he's making it for us because he wants to, you know, be successful for us. And so, you know, you do what you got to do, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. So with all your experience, what made you say, hey, I want to start my own company. Uh, not so, only I'm going to start my own company, I'm going to, I'm going to go into one of the most competitive <laughs> industries in North you know, America. Yeah, chocolate. no, you know, the, the chocolate, chocolate category is insane. Yeah, the chocolate category is insane. Absolutely. And it was one of those things where actually the opportunity came to me. So, oh. you know, I had, uh, I had, been with an organization and we had sold it and uh i wasn't sure what i was going to do i was traveling 200,000 miles on a year on a plane and uh, i was exhausted and i honestly didn't know what i wanted to do and uh the we're, we're owned by two families uh when i first came on you know red chocolate was in about 17 countries and i get a phone call out of the blue from one of the families and says look your name's popped up a bunch again i've been doing this for 30 years i've pretty good got it pretty good name in the industry and so um 
they said, would you meet with us? We want to talk to you. I said, of course, absolutely. Now, I had known who Red Chocolate was. See, I'm a type 2 diabetic, okay? Probably got there because I ate too much, you know, sugar chocolate when I was younger. But the fact is, I can't have sugar now, okay? It just wreaks havoc on my body. And, you know, I want to have a happy long life. So, cut out all sugars long ago. And so, when I was traveling, I actually be, happened to be in London at Heathrow Airport. And I saw red chocolate and I saw no sugar added, you know, non-GMO, gluten-free. So it had, it had the things that I was looking for. So I said, all right. So I picked up a bar and I was sitting waiting for my flight and I tried a little bit. I went, oh, this, this, this is too good, man. There's, there's no way this is no sugar added. So I had a serving of the chocolate, which is about a third. You know, you, you look at it and these chocolate bars are pretty damn big. You know, I had a third of this bar. I checked my blood glucose and it hadn't changed. I went, holy cow. Oh, okay. Well, this is nice. So I actually went back to the, to the W.H. Smith and grabbed all of the inventory they had, which was like nine bars. So I bought all the bars, threw them in my briefcase, and I took them home. Because to me, it was like an aha moment. So every time I traveled in Europe, I would go see where I could find red chocolate. And if I found it, I'd buy whatever inventory it was. And so getting this call, you know, it's that whole... You know the stars and moon align you know whatever you want to call it in your own world and so i said sure enough for me it was going to be fun just because they had no idea i knew who they were and i love the fact that i was gonna get to meet the people that actually put this beautiful product in the world and so i went and for four out we had a four hour meeting and for the first three and a half hours i explained to them why they didn't want to come into the u.s and that's because of exactly what you said extremely competitive cutthroat you know shelf you know so on all the different things i said you got a beautiful business if you come in here and you're not prepared for it you're going to go bankrupt because i've seen it happen to great companies they come in and they you know the u.s consumer which is an amazing consumer but everywhere else in the world all they see are the dollar signs they don't understand the intricacies of actually building a business in the u.s and how tough it is and so we we talked like i said for in about three and a half hours into it one of the folks that was part of the other family said, uh, are you done? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm done. They said, so when do you want to start? And I just shook my head laughing and said, you know what, guys, you must know something I don't know. So this could be fun. And you know what, if you're interested in it, let's build a partnership here. And that's when I became one of the partners of Red and I brought it to the U.S. So fast forward four years later, we're the number one chocolate sold on the Home Shopping Network. We're in 12,000 retail store doors across America. You know, we, uh, we're in 28 countries. So we've really grown and exploded. And the reason is, as you know, we're a great product. You know, I don't care how good your marketing is. I don't care how good your supply chain is. I don't care how good I am. Ultimately, the product's gotta taste good. And yeah. the product tastes amazing. Yeah. So that's how I got involved with Red. It went from personal to professional, Back to personal again, because what's great is as a type two diabetic, within 10 feet of me, I probably got 25 different uh, types of uh, red chocolate that we've been working on. You know, it's funny, I, I happen to pop up this one, which is our, our new one, our oat milk. This is the 123rd recipe. Damn. We went through 122 iterations before we decided it was gonna be this and you know, now we're proud and it's amazing. It's doing phenomenal. But even, you know, the, the one we launched last year, which was our blonde chocolate, which is a caramelized white chocolate, which you've had, yeah. you know, we, we don't want to come out with the same old, same old, because the whole idea is, you know, the families that own us are master chocolate makers. So they want to take what is available and make something different, something unique, something the world hasn't seen. That's the whole idea behind red chocolate. So. You know, yes, we've got our milk. Yes, we've got our dark. But when you start to look at the other ones, you know, whether it be the almond orange, whether it be the hazelnut and macadamia, the whole idea is for somebody like myself to be able to enjoy and indulge again. Yeah. So were were you a, a diabetic before you came on board? Yeah. Yeah. I've been a diabetic for probably a decade, okay. for over a decade. So and I joined the team four years ago. So yeah, yeah, I've had I've had the I've had the, the diabetes issue for a long time. Yeah, you know, it runs in my family. It runs in my family, you know. And uh, you know, call, I, I got it a little earlier, and, and really, so Red is bought eighty seven percent of the time uh, by female, you know, or head of household. And it's funny because I always say women are smarter than men. 
because see, women understand the health benefits. You know, you can indulge, just make it smart indulgence. Men, we don't understand that. We just want to indulge. Yeah. And then we get to be, you know, we get to be 50 and you go see the doctor and the doctor's like, you know what? You better start taking care of yourself or you're going to have a stroke. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, we got to. So, you know, that's what happened to me. You know, I was in my late 40s and the doctor said, you know what? I hope you enjoyed all that great food all around the world because now it's going to come crashing down. And that's exactly what happened. So, you know, I've got an amazing wife of 22 years. She can eat whatever she wants because she eats in moderation. She knows how she should. Me, on the other hand, I can't have that piece of cheesecake. I'm not allowed to. They say you, somebody, a wise man told me you pay now or pay later. <laughs> <laughs> it is so true. It is so true. Yeah. And believe me, if you pay later, you constantly pay. So you're better off just taking care of it in the beginning. Yeah. So what's it like um, getting the taste of the candy that you want? What's that process like? Because you said it's it's been it's taking you like 27 recipes. So what what's that process like? So it actually was 122 for it. So oh. what we do is we start out with with what we call an ideation session. So we we decide on what it is we'd like to accomplish. So you, you understand during the path of what your ultimate goal was. So, uh, every, you know, you think about caramel, who doesn't like a, a chocolate with caramel? And so, you know, when we talk about the car, our red blonde, which is caramelized white chocolate, I want to come out with something that had caramel in it, but caramel is sugar. We're no sugar added. So it wasn't like we were going to come out with something different and say, okay, we're going to have sugar now. That's not what we do. We got to stay true to who we are. And so <clears throat> we started to try to figure out ways that we can actually craft the product and still stay true to, to what our goals are and what our mission is. So, you know, as a company, we have 11 global patents and uh, it's from the production. This episode is brought to you by ERC. Let me ask you a question. Did you have a business during the pandemic with five or more employees? If the answer is yes, you might be leaving money on the table. All you gotta do is go to ERCBankroll.com and you can get your money. The best part about this, it only takes five minutes or less to see if you qualify. Go to ERCBankroll.com and put in your name, email address, answer two questions, click on the submit button and you're done. It's that simple. And get your money. So don't wait. Go to ERC bank to ingredient style to you know everything in between. And so this happens to be our 11th pack. And what we've done is we figure out a way to have a caramel that's used from milk, the lactose, the sugars, natural sugars, because my body can take a natural sugar. You know, like I can eat grapes which have sugar in them. Mm -hmm. I just can't eat a hundred of them, you know what I mean? Not that you'd want to, but my point is, you know, I can, my body can digest natural sugars. I can, my body can digest erythritol or maltitol. Stevia for me, I, I don't like the taste. That's why we don't use it because I just think it tastes funky, but that's just me. I just don't like it. And since I run it, I did get to decide what goes in. And so what we do is once we have what we want to do, then becomes the process of trying to figure out how it can be done. It's like, you know, if you think about it, you know, we want to go to Mars. Okay, now, how do we get there? And that's what we've, everybody, you read all the articles and all those different things on how they're trying to get to that point to go to Mars. Well, we knew we wanted a caramel chocolate. How do we get there with no sugar? Nobody had ever done it. There was nothing like it. And that's why when you eat blonde, there's literally nothing like it in the world. Nothing like it in the world. And we were able to get to where we wanted to go and it was again trial and error we call it kitchen samples so within our facility we have a smaller facility and that facility you can actually produce you know a, a small run where you know our other facility you know that's where we do our everyday products and things so what we do is we produce a small one so we can understand the flow through so we can understand what the finished good looks like because again for us you remember being a european company uh, it starts with the visual. We call it the experience. So, you know, somebody like yourself buys a product. For you, it's it's a value. And what we mean by value is 
not money wise. You know, if I line up 10 people, the value proposition is actually different for all 10, or it could be seven different ones. Somebody could say, I like the price. Okay, that's their value proposition. Other people say, you know what? I'm a diabetic. I can't have sugar. I don't want sugar. That's my value proposition. Another person could say, you know what? I'm looking for a clean ingredient label. Well, Red has that. That's their value proposition. So it's all these different things and a combination thereof that gives you that value proposition. So what we try to do is when we're building our goal is to stay within that value proposition. And so then we go through, like I said, the process of the different and, you know, we'll, we'll do a run and we'll say, ah, you know, it, I don't, it tastes gritty. And so you have to redo the process or I don't like the flavoring of it, you know, too much orange if it's one of our products with orange or not enough nut. And so you tweak and you constantly tweak, you come up with what you consider yourself to be something you can be proud of. And so every time we launch a product, it's something the organization can be proud of. Gotcha. So... I know you. I know you have a website online. And everything. I know mm -hmm. people get access to it. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, what stores are you in? So the great thing is, if you do go to the website, which is red-chocolate.com, I'll do a little plug for that. Uh, but if you go there, and I tell people always go there because there's a couple of reasons. Number one, you're going to learn about the history of it. Number two, there's a store finder, so you just got to type in your zip code, and you will you will find stores near you. But we're in. Kroger's, we're in Win Dixie. Like I said, if you just wanted to watch us on TV, about every six weeks, we're on the Home Shopping Network. We're, we're the top chocolate sold on the Home Shopping Network. They're a great partner of ours. We love working with them. As a matter of fact, uh, July 4th, we'll be on TV again. You'll see us. And then we're on again uh, throughout July and August and so on and so forth. But we are in uh, uh, the drug stores throughout the United States. There are 12,000 stores that carry our product. So go on the store finder list. Type in your zip, you'll have your list of stores, you can find it. But also, if you go on, which I, which is something I love, and uh, it's called our Chef Series. And, and I like to tell people about it because what we do is, well, don't get me wrong, eat our chocolate, enjoy, love it, it's awesome. But on the Chef Series, we have actually chefs from throughout the world that actually take the red product and add it to different meals. So there's like a beautiful mole sauce. There's these sweet potato bombs. There's all different kinds, whether it be a, a main meal or side dishes or even some desserts. There's a, a, a chocolate mousse that's awesome. And so, you know, you get a chance to see the chefs do it. And they're really short videos, so it's cool. So you get a chance to see it. You've got all the ingredients. Everything is done. So again, if you go to red-chocolate.com, that's the best spot to start. Because from there, you'll learn everything you need to know. And if you want to reach out to me, go to the About Us and all my contact information is there. I'm available and I talk to people all day long. So and what's it? What's the process like getting your product into these stores? Because, you, so, you, know, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I like Shark Tank. <laughs> right? Right, right. I like Shark Tank. And, I, you know, I so, see you come on Shark Tank and I know that has been a long road for them. These people been through a whole, they probably got ripped off once, <laughs> lost money, absolutely. almost bankrupt. And you know, by the time they make it to Shark Tank, it's pretty much like, oh man, we made it. <laughs> so what's that process yeah. like? You know, it's a good question actually. So what happens is um, we have what are called category managers. If you talk about retail grocery, we'll just take that that avenue because you've got retail, like, you know, Red is also, also in every Air Force uh, and Army exchange base in the world. You know, we're about to be in Navy. So there are different ways to go towards the different um, areas that we sell it. So if you take retail grocery, what happens is you, you meet with the category manager or the category buyer, uh, and you will walk them through, you know, what the product is. And, you know, I try to explain to people, especially when they're thinking, well, I, I make a great tomato sauce. I can sell it every day. I get those questions all the time. And what I tell people is, look, there's a thousand great tomato sauces. What makes yours different? And the fact that you've got your picture on it, it's not gonna make people buy it unless you look like a big tomato, you know what I mean? So. What, uh, what, you, what people should do is they, they have to understand what their role is within the category, be able to explain that quickly, and then behind it, 
having the the tools necessary to be able to have consumers know about it because the retailer you know that shelf space is very very expensive uh you know for them to run it every day and they've got their profitability they have to make and um you know so they need to know that if this product is going on my shelf what are you as the manufacturer or as the distributor what are you going to do to help me get it off so that could be everything from you know what are you doing on your social media channels you know we we talk to about three million people every week on you know insta TikTok, facebook you know we use them all and, and we enjoy it because it's a good conversation flow for us because we want to know what the hell people think of us we want to know what they're talking about we want to know how we can help them you know you think about food you know you go out tonight and you buy yourself a new shirt that's a very personal thing because it's something you chose What's even more personal is what you put inside your body. So by doing that, that's why we are on that most personal level that you can be. People are not only inviting us into their life, they're inviting us into their body. They're inviting us into their memories. So we want to know, are we doing well? Are we doing what we should do? What can we do better? So, you know, between the social media channels, between the investment that you do to be able to get it with to the consumer's eyes, and that's probably one of the biggest changes that's happened post COVID. So pre COVID, we get, we have what's called a shopper's experience, shopping experience. And so you'd go into a, you know, a, one of your local grocery stores and you'd see beautiful displays and you'd see different things. And you know, you, the experience and I'd see your eyes up, like what kind of lighting are they using over the fruit area? What are they doing, you know, with some of the general merchandise, you know, holiday themes, those kind of things. That's part of the shopping experience. Well, now, fast forward years later, people aren't spending as much time as they used to in retail. So therefore, you need, you meaning the manufacturer, need to get the message out before they even walk into the store because you're not getting that moment. Because pre-COVID, you had about 20 seconds, literally 20 seconds for a consumer to stop, look and go, that interests me, and to pick it up. Because if you think about the thousands of products that you walk past every single day, and you think about something like red, which the world has never seen. If you're not used to it, and I just put it on the shelf, and it's a shelf somebody like me never walked down because, again, can't have sugar. So when I go down the candy aisle, now all of a sudden I'm hearing about red. I'm hearing that this is a no sugar added, and it's in my candy aisle. Now I've got a reason. So it takes a lot of work, and it's, there's a lot of people behind it, you know, within my marketing group and my supply chain and my sales organization to make sure that A, the message gets out, B, the consumer hears the message and says, okay, yeah, this makes sense to me. And then three, ultimately the consumer walking into the retail store and picking up that product because you need that. So it's not just a matter of walking in, you know, to a, your local Kroger, and I call it throwing up on a person's shoes, you know, saying, hey, this is my new tomato sauce. What do you think? What can I get on shelf? It, it doesn't work that way. So it, it's a process, but it's a process that that is works and has worked for many years. You just have to understand what is needed to be able to be successful. Great, man. So you've sold, what, five companies. So what yeah. what's it like? What happens when, what's that process like? You know, cause I've actually, so, um, I, I work with a company that got, that got bought out mm -hmm. and they pretty much left us hanging. <laughs> that <laughs> they left us hanging, you know? Gotcha. And, and, and let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what was weird. Now everyone knew the, the like the cutoff date of, hey, the new ownership and, and staff is coming in they're going to take over and we're going to be gone we won't be here tomorrow so everyone all employees knew that right right but no one really wanted to communicate say hey what's going to happen with us so uh, am i going to be working here uh next week i don't know you know so i don't know you know so what what what's the <laughs> what's that like i don't know that is that is crappy leadership that's that's yeah. what it sounds like for you it sounds like terrible leadership so uh the very first time uh i was actually employee number three it was uh, the person i helped build the business plan and uh when they were ready to go i told them the kind of person they want to go 
hire. This was a, a friend of mine who uh, who I had worked with and she had this great idea and she called me and said, look, I got an idea. Can you help me with a business plan? I said, sure, no problem. So I helped her build the business plan, helped her get in touch with the manufacturing groups that she needed to work with. And so when I got her ready, you know, it was her and it was a person that had the money behind her. So they were employee one and two uh, and told them who I would hire and got in my car and drove off. And I was probably halfway home when I get a phone call from her. Hey, we found the perfect person. And now at this point, you know, I'm with a, an extremely large corporation. I've got over a billion dollars of responsibility. What? I had 174 people reporting into me at some varying level. So, you know, successful from a, from a corporate standpoint. And um, she said, we found the perfect person. I said, my God, that was quick. Who is it? Do I know him? She laughed. She said, yeah, it's you. And I went, oh, you'll never be able to afford me. She goes, oh, you're right. I won't be able to afford you, but I'll give you equity. And I went, huh? Interesting. I was like, well, you know, I, I got to talk over my wife. I had two young kids at the time. You know, it's a huge step, man. You know, I got to make sure there's food on the table, man. You know, I was a you know, single income family. And so I called my wife and I was telling her about it. She goes, well, what do you think of the product? I went, oh, I love the idea. I think it's a great product. And, you know, I've seen the finished products. They're, they're awesome. She's like, Glenn, do it. I said, hey, you know, I'm not going to have, you know, that safety net. And this thing, I could be completely wrong. She said, Glenn, you're going to work 100 hours a week to make it successful. I have no doubt. Why don't you just do it and prove to yourself that you can do it? And be, I said, you know what? If you want to let me try this, all right. She goes, do it. We're fine. We're going to be just fine. And I had this amazing woman say that to me. And I went, you know what? She believes me, man. I should believe me. And, you know, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it because I'm putting myself back in the car at that point. And so I called and I said, look, I'm ready. Let's do it. And then she said, turn around. We want to start right now. So I turned around. We signed the agreement. 18 months later. We were doing about 80 million in sales, and where we get an offer from a PE team, private equity team. And uh, she, uh, she called me and said, Hey, look, we got an offer. I said, Yeah, I know, I heard. I said, uh, You know, what do you guys, what are we going to do? And she said, Yeah, I don't know. You know, we're going through it. She goes, What do you think? I said, This is your baby. I'm willing to rock and roll. I'm having fun. But if you want to sell, you know, you sell. Now, for me, it, I stood to have a pretty nice payday. I'm not going to lie to you, but, you know, Again, what she wanted to do was fine with me. And so they decided to sell. So I remember sitting at the table and uh, one of the uh, PE groups, one of the members of the PE group said, so Glenn, what are you gonna do now? I said, I don't know. I didn't expect to be out of a job in 18 months. That wasn't really my plan. And he said, well, if you're gonna be in private equity, know this, when you come in, it's going to be fast and quick if you're successful. So you better make sure it's a soft landing. And I went, and I, and I kept that in my head at all times. And I said, all right, I gotta remember this. So after that, we were, I was more prepared as an individual to be able to sell an organization. You know, our last organization, everybody within the organization, the group that bought us was going to keep it the way it was, uh, but everybody within our organization, I demanded and expected to have a payout. And so there were people from all walks that were with the organization. Anybody that was there a year or more, received a nice bonus check because I wanted him to know this was sold because of the work that everybody did. It wasn't because of the four people sitting in the offices over there. You know, it was because of the hundred people that worked every single day, eight hours, 10 hours a day to get things done. So everybody could take pride in ownership. And that's the way I try to, to run businesses. You know, I've, I've got a saying for myself and it's part of my leadership mentality. You, you have a seat at the table. And what I mean by that is your opinion matters and your opinion counts, okay? But understand that, you know, you can give your opinion. I may take 1% of it. I may take 100% of it. I may say that's a great idea, but we can't do it. And we move on. Don't think it wasn't heard. It just means based on everything that's happening, we can't move forward fully with that idea. We've been in some, some meetings and it's funny. I was just looking for something that, yeah, here we go. So... With every product that we ship out, we actually have a card. And what you do is you scan it on the back with your cell phone, and we ask a couple of questions. Did it arrive the way you wanted, when you wanted, where'd you hear about it, so on and so forth. And that idea came from one of our marketing posts. I went, that's a phenomenal idea, let's rock and roll. You know, a week later, we had this going in. So there you go. <laughs> And the idea being that, you know, it, it, that came, you know, a lot of smart minds, but nobody thought about it. And this one person who has a really good mind, who's starting new within, you know, the corporate world said, hey, how about if we do this? I went, that's an awesome idea. Let's do it. 
because it made sense for what our mission is. So, you know, that's that's how I make sure that when we build now this, this is more, this is a labor of love. This is a legacy for me. You know, I want to get this brand here in America up to well over a hundred million dollars, which I know we can, uh, and uh, we're not going to sell because there's going to be a, a new leadership, new leadership group in here, making it bigger and bigger and bigger. Because this is red. At this point, it's like one of my kids. This is a lot more personal than selling widget A or widget B. Yeah. So before you came on board, how were red chocolate? How were they doing? So they were in about, like I said, about 17, 18 countries uh, prior to prior to me joining. They did a really good job throughout Europe. Uh, Red actually, the name Red comes from 17th century Eastern European literature. The word Red, you know, means passion, means love. And when it came over to the translation, so, you know, when you think about Valentine's Day, that isn't a hallmark greeting card thing, the whole red, the whole idea behind passion and love. It actually is from, you know, Eastern European literature. So they did a phenomenal job growing the business country after country after country. And then, you know, the, the U.S. is, you know, that's the diamond. That's the top of the mountain. You know, our U.S. market is massive, massive, especially within our category. Yeah. The chocolate category, there's a lot of chocolate is bought every single day and eaten by tens and hundreds of millions of people yeah man i i, I highly recommend you everybody go get it i got it <laughs> i got mine you get yours so hey you. last question how'd you get involved with, with wwe what uh, the commercial how uh, <laughs> this is awesome so the WWE, their corporate headquarters is in Stanford, Connecticut. And uh, I'm originally from Stanford, Connecticut. And so we used to always see all the wrestlers around, you know, because and they're, they were cool people. Like, you know, back in the day, Hulk Hogan, I remember driving by and he'd be mowing his lawn. And, you know, kids would be running up and the guy could be like in the middle of doing a thousand things, but he'd stop and sign every signature, man. And, you know, it was just, that was the kind of thing that, you know, they were always around, they were stars. You know, in this little town, but they were so cool and so nice. And so my brother actually uh, at that point owned restaurants and his restaurant was catering a uh, a movie event for Hulk Hogan called No Holds Barred. And this is so long ago. And uh, so, again, I, I was invited to go in because they had tickets. They said, hey, why don't you come? I was like, great. I'd love to come see a movie for free, especially world premiere. Red carpet, the whole nine yards. This is cool. So I went in, watched the movie. You know, they had Randy Macho Man Savage was there and lovely Elizabeth, all these guys, you know, all these wrestlers from, you know, the 80s and stuff. And it was, you know, it was really cool. Well, I was walking out and again, you know, you got to think Miami Vice. Yes, I was wearing a white t-shirt with a hot pink, you know, undershirt. You know what I mean? It was, it was the 80s. You know, you're supposed to look cool. Now I look back and I'm embarrassed, but it is what it is. Um, and so I was walking out of the theater and Mean Gene Orkelin looks at me and goes, hot pink for a hot movie. Come on over here. And so I walked over and they did a live event with me talking to him about, you know, the movie and what I thought about the movie and the scenes I liked and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, shook my hand and off i left right and so i thought i was like that's cool you know what the heck you know 12 people saw it big deal and so i'm actually uh fast forward about two weeks later i'm standing uh at the at the beach at the ice cream truck and there's this little kid and he's staring at me this kid's pointing at me he's talking to his mom and he's pointing at me and i'm like is there something on my face you know what <laughs> why is this kid pointing at me what's going on and uh, the mom walks over and goes, excuse me. She said, I'm sorry, my son's pointing. I'm like, no, no problem, anything wrong? She's like, no, he was just excited because he saw you on TV this morning. I'm like, I, I don't think he saw me on TV this morning. She's like, no, you were on a commercial for the WWE. And I went, what? And she said, yeah, there was a commercial on And she told me, so, and I started laughing. I tell you what, it was, I got my, I guess I got my 15 minutes of fame. Because I would go places and be like, I saw you on TV. I saw you on TV. And it was, so that was my commercial for the WWE. So I don't know if being on an airplane that got hit by lightning twice was more exciting or being in a commercial for the WWE. Two, two varying degrees, but both really exciting. So yeah, that was my commercial for the WWE, man. 
And the nice thing is, I actually still have it on VHS. So I show it to my boys when they were when they were probably I don't know ten. I said, you know, your old man was used to be pretty cool, and I put the tape in it. And the first thing they say is, "You're wearing a hot pink shirt, Dad." But I went, "It was the '80s, man. Everybody wore it." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, I highly recommend everybody go check out Red Chocolate dot com i got mine you know i got mine uh you know i got i got all of them so you know i highly recommend you go check it out and uh any last words you know what thank you very much for having me and i really appreciate it i love your podcast i listen to them i i, I always i always try to get information out of them because uh, it helps me in my career and in my life so thank you for what you do and you know thank you for having me on i, I really appreciate it there you have it like share this episode all links will be found in the show notes until next time we're out peace